And if you don't happen to have your Bible with you, you're welcome to use the one that's next to the hymn books there in front of you. As we think this morning of the subjects of mercy and justice, mercy and justice, you'll notice in the 101st Psalm that this is a Psalm of David. This is one of two in this section of Psalms that are attributed to King David. As you remember that David was a man after God's own heart. And being a man after God's own heart, David desired to rule as a righteous king, as a fair king, as a gracious king. But David recognized his own shortcomings. He recognized his weakness. He recognized his humanity. So while David was indeed a great king, this psalm reminds us that there's coming a greater king. King Jesus is coming, and he is the perfect king. He is the holy king. And so as we consider David's commitment, we are reminded of the Lord Jesus, for he is the righteous king. He is the king of mercy, and he's also the just judge. Look at verse 1 with me this morning as we think of our king today, and notice the character of the fair king, the character of the fair king. In verse 1 we read, I will sing of mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Verse 1 starts off with the word sing. And as we've talked about this word in the past, let me remind you that the word sing is a picture of someone who is strolling about and singing. So maybe you've been to a restaurant that's like that, that had maybe live music and the, the person who was singing or playing the violin was moving from table to table. This would be the picture of this kind of singing. When you see somebody who's, who's walking around and singing or walking about and whistling or humming, that generally is a person who is either crazy or someone who is glad. And we'll take it to mean that this is a person who is glad. A person with a joyful heart. A heart that is full of joy, overflowing with praise. Notice in verse 1 that David directs his joy to God. Do you see it there? To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. The Lord is worthy of our praise. The Lord is worthy of our praises, not just when we feel good, not just when life is going well, not jo just when we feel glad or joyful, not when it's just convenient, but God is worthy of our praise all the time. And the reason he's worthy of our praise all the time is because everything that God is and all that he says and all that he thinks and all that he does is perfect and praiseworthy. So we can and we should sing praise to the Lord. But notice in verse 1 that David is particularly happy about something in particular. He's particularly joyful about mercy and justice. Are you there with me? Do you see it there? I will sing of mercy and justice. Now think of those two qualities and mull in your mind for just a little bit, not only what they are, but the connection between mercy and justice. Mercy and justice are certainly divine virtues. They are divine characteristics. That's why David praises the Lord. That's why he would say to you, O Lord, I sing about mercy and justice. You see, mercy and justice define who God is. He is merciful. He is just. Merciful and mercy and justice describe how God works. He works with mercy and he works with justice. And we're also reminded that mercy and justice come from God. God is the one who gives mercy. He is the one who brings about justice. And God is the one who empowers us to be able to act with mercy and to act justly toward one another. So let's think about these two words for just a moment. 
And let's take them one at a time. What is mercy? What is mercy? Well, the word mercy is the word kesed. And that word in the Old Testament refers to favor. It's also described as God's grace. It's also translated as pity and love. The word mercy can also mean faithfulness and kindness and goodness. It can also describe devotion. And so when you think about that word mercy and all of the different words that describe mercy, we can conclude a bunch of things, but one thing in particular we can conclude is that it's, it's pretty hard to describe mercy. It's difficult to define what mercy is because there's so many descriptions of mercy. So that's mercy. So what is justice? What is justice? Well, in verse 1, we're introduced to mercy and justice together. The word justice is the word mishpat, and what that word means is it means a verdict. And it also is described as a sentence. So let's think about those two words for a little bit. A verdict is a decision. It's a, it's a conclusion based upon information. And the, the verdict specifically would either be guilty or innocent. Guilty or not guilty. Now, the word sentence is described by the word punishment or penalty. This would be connected to the word verdict. So, in other words, when we think about the word justice, justice, that word brings together the qualities of a verdict and a sentence. Those two qualities are joined together in the, word, in the word justice. So we would say that justice is served when there is a correct verdict and when there is a, a, an appropriate amount of punishment that would be car carried out. A, a correct verdict is, a, is announced, is pronounced, and, a, and an appropriate punishment is administered. Now, this is where we come back to what I mentioned a little bit ago. How, how can... Mercy and justice coexist. How can they go, how do they go together? Do they go together? David here is singing of the mercy and justice of the Lord. You know, in the past I've described mercy as God withholding what we deserve to receive. And, and grace is like the opposite side of that same coin, is that grace is God giving to us what we don't deserve. We like to think of mercy, or maybe we do think of mercy, as, as avoiding something or, or like getting out of punishment. When someone shows mercy, it usually means that you don't get the spanking or you don't get the whipping. But how can justice be served if we're allowed to escape punishment because of mercy? You see the dilemma there? How, how do they go together? Well, the idea is this. We, we may escape punishment because of mercy, but someone ultimately has to pay the penalty because of justice. Somebody's got to pay. Someone will be held guilty. Someone must take the place of the one who is guilty but who was let off because of mercy. Someone must be, treat, must be treated like they were guilty. And so here we have, in those two words, a tremendous picture of what? Of salvation, don't we? Yeah. Romans 3, all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. The word all is everyone. Isaiah 59, verse 2, your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God to us is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, there's that word, because of his great love, which is connected to mercy, with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He has made us to be alive together with Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. 
Each one has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Don't we see mercy there? Where we were the ones who deserved to have the penalty of our sin laid upon ourselves, but God, as merciful and as just, chose to lay that upon his son, the Lord Jesus. The just and holy God exacted justice by pouring out his wrath and laying the punishment for our sin upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the just and holy God. But the merciful God extends mercy to whosoever would believe in him. It's given the promise will not perish, but will have everlasting life. But those who refuse to believe and those who choose to trust in themselves rather in Jesus Christ will ultimately bear the weight of God's justice and will experience what it means to not be shown mercy, but rather will be given the penalty for sin. King Jesus is merciful and he is just. He is gracious and he is fair. Jesus is the king of righteousness. He is the prince of peace. And David desired to rule like that. He wanted to rule God's people with mercy and with justice. Folks, as, as God's children, we fight for justice. And as God's children, we should choose to show mercy, even as our Heavenly Father does. That's the character of the fair king. Look at verse 2. And I want you to notice the conduct of the faultless king. We read verse 2. Let's start there again. I will behave wisely, David writes, in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. If you think about, or if you, if you do an examination of David's life, read back through 2 Samuel. Uh, read about David and his life. Many times, he didn't behave very wisely. Not like he talks about here in verse 2. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Many times, he didn't live in a perfect way. In fact, when you read and examine David's life, you'll see a man who during his life was a coveter, a thief, an adulterer, a liar, and a murderer. If you look at the Ten Commandments, that's half of them right there. <laughs> but as you look at David's life, don't miss this. In spite of all of that, we, we see in David's life a man who loved, God, who loved God. We see a man who had a heart for God in David. So what's he saying here in verse 2? I will behave wisely in a perfect way. David is not stating a reality about his life. He knew that. We know that. Everybody who reads about David knows that. He's not stating a reality. He was not always wise. He was not always perfect. <laughs> David is rather stating a resolve in his heart. It was his goal. It was the determination in his heart to live like this, to live in a wise way, to live in a perfect way. Notice his resolve, verse 2, I will behave wisely. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Verse 3, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Verse 4, a perverse heart shall not depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Those are good, good goals for our lives. Will we always be able to achieve those goals? No, not hardly. In fact, I would probably say that there will be more times when we don't than when we do. But nonetheless, they are still good goals to have in our life. When you think about what we just read, David's plan here, his purpose, his resolve sounds very similar to what he describes in Psalm 1 about the blessed man. Listen to the blessed man in Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. 
but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates, he thinks about, he mulls over in his heart day and night. David resolved to live his life and to lead his family and to rule over his people blamelessly. That's what that word perfect means. With devotion to God, with devotion to God's word, with devotion to God's ways, David resolved to do this. But at the same time, David recognized that it would be impossible to do that on his own. Living that way in his own strength was an impossibility. That's why David realized he needed the Lord. And so he called out to God. You see it there in verse, in verse uh, 2? Oh, when will you come to me? When will you come to me, Lord? You know my heart. You know how I want to live. You, you know how I want to serve you. But I can't do it. When will you come to me? To be a successful king, David needed God. He, he needed God's involvement in his life. And he needed God's involvement in every aspect and every detail of his life. We're no different. You know, too often we mistakenly think that the Christian life is left up to us to do. God saves is kind of like that old Mission Impossible show. Do you remember that? Where the impossible mission would be given to the fellow and then he would be, say, he would be given the words, good luck. <laughs> good luck. I hope you make it. And if you don't, by the way, I'm going to disavow any knowledge of this. We think like, think like this, I've got to work harder. I've got to try harder. I've got to just be a little bit more committed. But folks, none of that works for very long. It might work for a little while, but none of that kind of thinking and that resolve in your heart will stand up to the test of time because we're weak. We're sinful. We fall short. But the good news is that God doesn't expect you to live the Christian life on your own. Did you know that? He doesn't expect that. He doesn't demand that. In fact, God has given us himself. He has given us the Holy Spirit who indwells and empowers and informs and encourages us to live out the life of Christ. Literally, God lives out the life of Christ through the believer that is surrendered to him. God has given us the church. He has given us relationships with other believers. Why? Well, to encourage, to strengthen, to train one another in order to be able to walk with the Lord and to serve the Lord with gladness and with perseverance. David cries out in verse 2, Oh, when will you come to me, Lord? That ought to be our cry. In fact, many times it is when you're in trouble. When you're in trouble... We often say, oh, Lord, help me. Come to me right now. Actually, come yesterday. We don't cry out to God, and we don't desire his presence when everything's going great. Not very often, anyway. You know, when life is good, why don't we call out to God? Because deep down, we think that we don't need him right now. But Jesus said in John 15, abide in me, and I in you. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So our cry every day and even throughout the day and in every situation should be, oh, and it must be, oh, Lord, I need you. How I need you. Every hour I need you. That ought to be our cry. I need you now, Lord, in order to live for you now. The righteous king rules righteously. The righteous king rejects evil. Look at verse 5. Notice how else the righteous king works. Verse 5, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. The, the word slander means to accuse. Uh, did you know that Satan is called the, the accuser? He's called the slanderer. 
Verse 5, he who secret, whoever secretly slanders. That, that idea of secretly slandering implies a, a false accusation. And that would be a, a lie because it's given with the intent of, of trying to cause damage to a person, trying to cause damage to a person's reputation or a person's ministry. The righteous king, notice in verse 5, determined to get rid of slander from his kingdom. Him I will destroy, we read in verse 5. The word destroy means to remove. It means to, to cut off or to consume. The king resolved that he would remove slander from his kingdom and that he would restore truth to the land. But notice the righteous king also determines in verse 5 to deal with pride. Look there with me. The, the one who has a haughty heart or a haughty look and a proud heart, him I will not endure. Uh, the, the words, their haughty look, uh, literally that means one who has high eyes, to think highly of yourself, to, to think better of yourself than what is really true. Paul tells us to consider others better than yourself, to not think highly or put, put self first. Proud heart there literally means to have a broad mind. To have high eyes and a broad mind. Proud heart could be translated as to be open-minded. We are encouraged in our society to be open-minded, aren't we? To be tolerant. Those who aren't are bigoted and prideful and racist. Is it okay to say that word here? I hope so. One who is broad-minded thinks there's other acceptable ways besides God's way. That's, that's why, that's what Satan concluded when he chose to rebel against God. I know what God's way is, but my way is better. That's what Adam and Eve concluded when they sinned. I know we're not supposed to do this, but this is a good way. And folks, that's what we think whenever we choose the path of sin. I know I shouldn't do this, but God will forgive me, or God will get over it. Pride is the, the root and the beginning point of every sin. If you take every sin and you trace back through that sin and you come back through the, why did I do that? You'll come to the word pride. That's where it is. The king here says, I'm not going to put up with that. I will not put up with pride in my kingdom. I will not put up with those who act proudly in the kingdom. This is what the righteous king resolves. So what do we do with pride? What do we do with slander? Well, a couple of things. Number one, we should ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that and then to root it out in our lives. There's pride everywhere. Lord, reveal it in my life. Rooted out of my heart, rooted out of my mind. And then the second thing we do is that we engage in the process that Jesus gave us in Matthew 18 to confront sin and to discipline one another in godliness and holiness. That's how the faultless king conducts himself. Look at verse 6, and I want you to notice very quickly and finally the care of the faithful king. In verse 6, we read, these words, my eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way shall serve me. My eyes shall be on. This is a, a picture of recognizing something or of, of responsibility for something. The, the king was responsible for his people. The king was responsible for what took place in his kingdom. He was responsible for maintaining order and for administering justice and for extending mercy. He was responsible for these things. So since the king was responsible, don't you think that he would pay attention to what was going on? <coughs> yeah, the, the, the king would pay attention to how his people were behaving themselves. Here we see that the king, in verse 6, he notices those who were faithful. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land. There the word faithful means st 
steadfast. Uh, that, that word also means trustworthy. The king's eyes were on the faithful in his kingdom. And the king saw them. He, he knew them by name. He recognized and he acknowledged their faithfulness to the king and to the kingdom. And in recognition of the faithful, notice what the king did. He rewards them. Look at verse 6. The faithful of the land shall dwell with me. That's why I love how David says in the 23rd Psalm, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The faithful were blessed because they could live in the king's presence. The faithful, were they lived under the king's power. They experienced the king's protection. They enjoyed the king's provision. The king was faithful to the faithful. Notice, secondly, the reward. The faithful of the land shall dwell with me, and he shall serve me. Now, you might think, wow, that doesn't sound like a very good trade, does it? I get to be a servant. Wow. <laughs> now, the word serve there means to, to attend to, to minister to. And so serving the good king was not a form of punishment. It wasn't a bad thing to serve the good king. It was not a painful thing or a trying thing or a boring thing to serve the good king. Serving the good king was an honor. It was a privilege. And it was something in your life that would produce pleasure. And it would bring satisfaction and fulfillment in your life. It was a reward to dwell with the king. It was a reward to serve the king. But notice in verse 7, the king also noticed the wicked in his kingdom. Look at verse 7 with me. He who works deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Early I will destroy all the wicked of the land that I may cut off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. There the word deceit. He who works deceit. That refers to betrayal. It refers to treason or treachery. So we can look at that word and consider deceit to be like the opposite of what it means to be faithful. You have the faithful and you have the deceitful. The king's eyes were on the faithful, but notice here that the king's eyes were on the wicked too. The king saw them. He knew them by name. He knew what they had done. He knew their motives. And notice that the king rewards, or we guess we should say he repays, the wicked for their behavior. Look at verse 7. He shall not dwell in my house. He won't enjoy the presence of the king and, and the provision and the protection and the power of the king. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. Verse 8, I will destroy all the wicked of the land. Here the king is saying, I'm going to purge that from the land. I'm going to purge that from the kingdom. I'm going to prevent wickedness from influencing my people. And the king possessed power to do that. You see, the king, he had tremendous power. He had tremendous responsibility. The king was responsible for his house. He was responsible for his family. He was responsible for his capital city and his officials and his government and the, and the faithful operation of his government. The king was responsible for the physical well-being of his people. He was responsible for their spiritual well-being and the spiritual condition of his land and his kingdom. And the king carried out his responsibility as he reigned with mercy and with Justice kind of brings us right back to where we started. Verse 1, I will sing of mercy and justice to you, O Lord. I will sing praises. Who is this righteous king? Who is this king of glory? This righteous king is none other than King Jesus. It's King Jesus. King Jesus rules with righteousness. He he rules with mercy. He rules with justice. And during the millennium and for all of eternity, King Jesus will rule. And he will reign. And he will rule and reign in that way, with mercy and with justice. And folks, we are his subjects. But even more than that, we are his children. 
citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So the question is, are we living like we're children of God? Are we faithful? Are we blameless? Are we true? Are we honest? No, if we examine our lives, we're not like that. But guess what? In Christ, we're seen like that. In Christ Jesus, or in other words, through faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, God brings us into a position where he sees us as blameless. He sees us as faithful and true and honest. Do we sin? Sure. Do we make mistakes? You better believe it. Does God forgive? Absolutely. Do we forgive? Hopefully. <laughs> we should, right? You know, ultimately, we represent the kingdom of God. And ultimately, we reflect the king of the kingdom of God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Do others see Jesus in you? Maybe not a perfect picture, but do others see Jesus in you? And the question this morning is, are you part of the family of God? Are you able to join with others and sing that Bill Gaither song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God? Family of God has lots of problems because there are sinners in the family of God, but we are redeemed sinners. We are forgiven sinners. We have been reclaimed by the king and made his, and he has bought us with his precious blood. As we shared earlier, all have sinned. We all need a savior. We're all under, whether you like it or not, the kingship of the Lord Jesus, because whether you like it or not or believe it or not, he's king and he is Lord. Are you his child? The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, not by our good works so that none of us can boast. And so today, if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you would believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, the promise is that he will save you. Because he's promised to save whosoever believes in him. And he has promised to save whosoever would call upon his name with faith. And so, would you be courageous enough to trust Jesus with your life and your eternity today? He's worthy to be trusted. He is the king, and he's the king who has mercy, and he is the king who is just. So, if you're not born again today, would you trust him? Would you ask him to save you and forgive you and make you part of his family? Would you purpose in your heart that you would trust him and serve him and follow him for the rest of your days? You would surrender to his lordship and his leading in your life. If you are saved this morning, maybe you're not walking with the Lord, would you make that decision that you would return to the king and begin to trust and follow him again? If you're walking with the Lord, but yet there's this part of your life that you have control over, maybe your decision today would be to let the king have that, to give that to the Lord. He can handle it. He can do it. And he will. He will do exceedingly and abundantly more than what we could ever do or what we could ever ask or what we could ever imagine. But the decision ultimately is up to each one of us, and that's the invitation this morning for you to trust Jesus, whether it would be for salvation or whether it would be for a new life or whether it would be for some area of your life that is maybe upside down right now or maybe for some area of your life that you've been holding on to and it's not been working very well. That's the invitation this morning, and it's for whosoever. And so would you pray with me right now?